السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين and welcome to the mothers of the believers in the last episode we were talking about Khadija رضي الله عنها and we saw her important place in supporting the Prophet وسلم, in the very crucial and beginning stages where a lot of support was needed, a lot of monetary support was needed for the da'wah and for calling people to Islam, how she endured the punishments and the torture, even though she wasn't included in it by, by tribal relations, but she endured all that with her husband وسلم, And then we began to mention the year of sorrow and the passing away of Khadija radiallahu anha, and after that we're going to start talking about Sauda bint Zam'a radiallahu anha, the second wife in, in chronological order of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi So make sure you watch this whole episode. We're going to talk about Sauda bint Zam'a radiallahu anha when we return. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Amma ba'd. So we're talking about Khadija radiallahu anha. We mentioned her support for the Prophet sallallahu We mentioned that towards the end of her life, this was a really difficult time. The Muslims were boycotted. They were sent out into the ravines of uh, Shab Abi Talib and they stayed there for three years. They suffered. And it is said by some historians and scholars say that this, in this period is when the health of Khadija radiallahu anha deteriorated so much and it was kind of like the catalyst or part of the, one of the things that was related to the death of Khadija radiallahu anha. Now just before the death of Khadija radiallahu anha, Abu Talib died and he was one of the, the biggest supporters and protectors of the Prophet sallam. and after Abu Talib passed away, Khadija radiallahu anha also shortly thereafter passes away and this becomes a very difficult time for the Prophet ﷺ. It, was be, it became known as Amul Huzn, the year of sorrow or sadness. And the Prophet ﷺ was so saddened that some of the, the companions who witnessed this said that we were, we were feared for the Prophet ﷺ from how much sadness had overtaken him. And so, and to add to that, then the Prophet ﷺ attempted to go to a ta'if, and this is a famous story that everyone knows, where he went to a ta'if and he called people there to Islam. And instead of accepting his call, they all pelted him with rocks and they threw stones at him and they made the Prophet ﷺ bleed. And so just to add to all the difficulty. But then Jibreel ﷺ came with him was the angel of the mountains. And the angel of the mountains suggested to the Prophet ﷺ that if you want, just command and I will crush the people between the two mountains. So crush everyone in Mecca between these two mountains. And you imagine that for so many years, for over a decade now, they've been torturing the Muslims and giving them a hard time and, and being enemies to the Prophet ﷺ. And now his uncle passed away, his wife passed away, and they had just finished throwing rocks at the Prophet ﷺ. So you'd imagine that easily he would command and they would be crushed. But this was not the gentle and forgiving nature of the Prophet ﷺ. What he did was he said to the angel that leave them because I have hope that in the future, inshallah, or probably from their descendants, some people will enter into Islam. And this is how the da'ya is, and this is how the Prophet ﷺ was always thinking and always caring about people, hoping that they will be saved from the hellfire. And this is also a characteristic that you find in all the successful du'a today, that they really care that people get saved from the hellfire. And that's what sets them apart usually from everyone else. So, with the death of Khadija radiallahu anha, the Prophet ﷺ, now his household, he had his four daughters, and he had other people in his household, and basically someone was needed to take over or to take responsibility of the household, take care of everyone. And so here, a woman by the name of Khawla bint Hakim came to the Prophet ﷺ, and she suggested two people for him to get married to. And one of them is Sauda bint Zam'a that we're going to start talking about now, insha'Allah. So her name was Sauda bint Zam'a, the daughter of Zam'a, the son of Qais, the son of Abd, Abd Shams. And she was Qurayshiyah from the tribe of Quraysh. Now before marrying the Prophet ﷺ, she was actually married to her cousin, whose name was As-Sakran ibn Amr. 
And she and her husband were from the early Muslims. She became Muslim very early and her husband became Muslim very early on. And with the persecution and the difficulty, they made hijrah to Abyssinia. And there they had a baby boy named Abdurrahman. They called him Abdurrahman. And they returned from Abyssinia. And when they returned, her husband, Sakran ibn Amr, he died in Mecca, just when they came back from Abyssinia. So she was basically left alone. She had her, her father, who was an old man, and it's also said that he was becoming blind. So she was, he had no one really to take, to take care of her or look after her. So after her waiting period was over, the Prophet ﷺ sent to her. And before that, it is said that she had seen this dream where she saw the moon descend onto her lap. And we're going to see this dream occur a lot of times with other mothers of the believers. She saw the moon come down from the heavens and fall onto her lap. And uh, so basically this was the, the fact that she was going to get married to the Prophet ﷺ. And she was actually the first woman to be married to the Prophet ﷺ after Khadija. This was one month after uh, the, the, the death of Khadija during the month of Shawwal. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates, she said, when Khadija radiallahu anha died, Khawla bintu Hakim, and Khawla bintu Hakim, she was uh, like a matchmaker. And she was the wife of the famous companion Uthman ibn Mad'un radiallahu anhu. And Khawla bintu Hakim came to the Prophet sallallahu and she said, oh, oh Messenger of Allah, why don't you get married? So then the Prophet sallallahu asked her, to whom? And there are different narrations, we're going to take about two of them. So she said, why don't you get married? He said, to whom? And he said, she said, if you want, there is a virgin or there is a woman who has been previously married. So the Prophet sallallahu asked her, who is the virgin? And who is the one that was previously married? So she said, Khawla bin Hakim said, As for the virgin, she is the daughter of the most beloved of people to you, the daughter of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And as for the one that was previously married, that was Sauda bin Zama. She has believed in you and she has followed you. So then Khawla says, Then I went to Sauda and her father, and he was an old man, and I greeted him, and he greeted me back, and I said, How are you? And he said to her, Who are you? And she said, I'm Khawla bint Hakim. And then he spoke to her a little bit. Then she said, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, mentioned Sauda. Meaning, he mentions her that he wants to, to, to ask for her in marriage. He mentions Sauda bint Zama. So then her father, he said he is Kareem, meaning he, like he is noble, like he's a good person. So what does your friend say? Meaning, what does Sauda think of this? Because, of course, after all, they have to get her approval. So then she says she would like that because she had already asked her and Sauda agreed and she said, go ask my father. This is clarified in another narration. So then she said she would like that. So then he tells her, then tell him so he may come, meaning come and so they can arrange the wedding and everything. And it was said that her brother, Abd or Ibn Zam'a, when he heard the news, he was uh, not a Muslim at the time. So when he heard the news that the Prophet was going to marry his daughter, he put dirt on his head. This was like a, a, a gesture and kind of a dramatic way uh, for the Arabs to show when there's like really bad news. They would take dirt from the ground and they would put it on top of their head. So he put dirt on his head like that. Later on, when he became a Muslim, he said, I was like uh, someone of weak uh, opinion. And or, or like of bad opinion the day I put dirt on my head because the Messenger of Allah وسلم, married Sauda. So this is after becoming a Muslim. He's looking back at how bad his reaction was. He says, uh, you know, I wasn't thinking well that day. Now, <clears throat> in other narrations, like I was alluding to, there was uh, Khawla bin Hakim. She tells the Prophet وسلم, that it appears that you have become lonely after the death of Khadija. And he tells her, yes, she was the mother of my daughters and the true housewife. And then she suggests to him to marry Sauda bint Zam'a. And then he tells her, why don't you go ask her? And in any case, they set the, like the mahr, the dowry, at 400 gold dirhams. And she was, like we said, not young, about 55 years of age. And of the few of the mothers of the believers, or the only one that was not really mentioned for her exquisite beauty. But inshallah, more on that when we come back, because we've run out of time, so don't go anywhere. كل نفس ذائقة الموت وإنما توفون أجوركم يوم القيامة 
فمن زحزح عن النار وأدخل الجنة فقد فاز وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور حج The Journey of Ibrahim alayhi salam is geared as an educational documentary that will take the audience through the footsteps of Ibrahim and the Muslims today as they perform the once-in-a-lifetime journey of Hajj. The story is told by some of our well-known scholars of today as they reveal the importance and significance of the Muslims' Hajj and how it relates to the journey of the father of religions, Ibrahim. All right, welcome back to the show, everyone. We want to talk about an event that made Sauda radiallahu anha one of the best friends and one of the most beloved to Aisha radiallahu anha. Even though there was a big age difference between the two, but Aisha radiallahu anha really very much loved Sauda radiallahu anha. Part of that also is due to her, like her demeanor and her always good and kind attitude and her good sense of humor. She was a, a lot of fun to be around. And you see, the interesting thing is that I mean, uh, someone with a good sense of humor enters the household of the Prophet ﷺ at the time when there is a lot of sorrow and a lot of sadness. And Sauda anha would like uh, tell uh, the, the the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ about her times in Abyssinia. And obviously she saw Ruqayya. Remember now, Ruqayya is the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ from Khadija. And she was the wife of Uthman and they were in Abyssinia. So Sauda met her there. So she would tell them the news of what Ruqayya is doing there, what's happening in Abyssinia, and she made a very nice and lively atmosphere at the household of the Prophet ﷺ. So then Aisha narrates, she said, when Sauda became older, she gave her night with, with, her night with the Prophet ﷺ to me. And she said, O Messenger of Allah, this is Sauda, I have given my night with you to Aisha. So of course the Prophet ﷺ would, would distribute the nights amongst his wives. So Sauda radiallahu anha being an older woman and she had n no need like for like uh, like um, for a man really. So she said she's going to give her night to Aisha so that it's halal for him to go to Aisha on her night. And of course Aisha radiallahu anha would love to be with the Prophet ﷺ and so she was very happy and she always loved Sauda after this incident. So the Prophet then would give Aisha two days, hers and that of Sauda radiallahu anha. Now as we said, the explanation for that is that she had no desire for men, she was an older woman, but she also wanted to be resurrected as one of the mothers of the believers. There are narrations that she heard the Prophet wanted to divorce her, and then she went and she offered the Prophet that to give her night to, Saud, to Aisha, and she only wanted to be resurrected as one of the mothers of the believers. And she was uh, very, very obedient to the Prophet It was said that after she made the Hajj with the Prophet this is the famous Hajjatul Wada', the farewell pilgrimage. She made this pilgrimage with the Prophet and the other mothers of the, of the believers. And after that, she never left her home again, ever. And it was said that only Sauda bint Zam'a and Zainab bint Jahsh that we're going to talk about in the future episode, inshaAllah, only these two never ever went out and never made Hajj again. They said that no animal will carry us, meaning we're not going to travel on a camel or anything, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. While other mothers of the believers, they made Hajj, but they would not leave home, of course, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them in the Quran. وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى وَأَقِمْنَ الصَّلَاةِ And remain in your homes. But so far as Sauda radiallahu anha, Zainab bin Tujahs, they never left their home, not even for Hajj after that. And uh, then Aisha radiallahu anha, <coughs> she said that uh, Sauda sought permission from the Prophet ﷺ, this was during the Hajj, on the night of Muzdalifah to leave before the crowds, before the rest of the people come. And she said, she explained that she was slow, and which means that she was a heavy woman. And we're saying that now because this uh, narration describes her. So she was a heavy woman and uh, the Prophet ﷺ gave her permission to leave before the crowds. And there were other incidents as well that were mentioned uh, regarding Sauda. Part of that was the revelation of the ayat of hijab. In this incident here, the wives of the Prophet 
would go out at night to answer the call of nature. So they have to leave the home to go out there, like into because there weren't like restrooms in the homes. So they would go out in the dark at night, out to the out, outskirts or like outside, and then that's where they answer the call of nature. So Umar radiallahu anhu used to tell the Prophet sallam to he used to tell him cover up your wives. So meaning that they will have like full, uh, full face covering. This is now. And this is what was kind of what we're going to look at in more detail when we discuss Aisha radiallahu anha. So this is the face, the full face covering. So here the Prophet ﷺ didn't respond to the call of Umar because if the Prophet ﷺ did that, it would become a part of the religion. And so uh, it was narrated then that uh, Saud radiallahu anha went out one time and Umar recognized her. So he said to her, even though it was dark, he said to her, Oh Sauda, we have recognized you. So Umar was hoping that the ayat would be revealed for the wives of the Prophet ﷺ to be completely covered. And then, sure enough, after that, the, the ayat were revealed and then the wives of the Prophet ﷺ were covered in their entirety. Now, it is said that uh, Saud radiallahu anha, uh, she was also a very uh, good cook. And n not only that, but Aisha one time, she cooked some food and then she brought it to the Prophet ﷺ and she offered it. And this just shows you now the kind of atmosphere and the attitude that was in the prophetic household. Some people would imagine it was just seriousness the whole time. But like we said, it's still a human household. So they had times when they laughed, sometimes when they were sad, sometimes when they quarreled. As we're going to look at, especially when we discuss uh, Hafsa radiallahu anha, how the wives of the Prophet ﷺ would quarrel with him and they would argue with him and they would get upset with him and he would get upset with them. So here, Aisha radiallahu anha, once she cooked some food and then she brought it to the Prophet And then she offered Sauda radiallahu anha, who was there, she offered her to eat. So Sauda refused to eat, she, she just didn't want to eat. So then Aisha tells her, eat or I'm going to smear it on your face. Meaning, jokingly, I'm going to put the food on your face. So Sauda refused to eat, so Aisha says, I put my hand in the food and then I put it on her face. So what happens? Because they're joking now. The Prophet ﷺ, he laughed. Because now Aisha radiallahu anha, she's a young woman, and you know, you can imagine her being lively. And then Sauda radiallahu anha, also a good humored, good natured. So then the Prophet ﷺ then told Sauda to also smear the face of Aisha, and then Sauda radiallahu anha took the food, and Aisha says, So she smeared my face, so the Prophet ﷺ laughed again. So this is the beautiful atmosphere that we see that there is laughter, they can joke, and it doesn't go against being. Religious, it doesn't go against being God fearing to joke. Of course, it's not that as we do today, uh, joking and laughing all day and all the time, and watching comedy on television, listening to comedy on the radio, trying to joke with people all the time. It, they didn't go overboard like that, but they still joked and they laughed, and that didn't go against uh, them being religious and being, you know, having taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this was kind of the, like we said, they could joke and there wasn't an issue with that. And some people think that to be religious, just frowning all day and, you know, no smiling and this is a good religious brother. But that's not the case. Prophet ﷺ would laugh and joke and sit and talk to them. But then they described that when he heard the adhan, he got up as if he did not know us. Very serious now because it's time for the adhan, time for salah. So there's a time for joking, but then when it's time for ibadah, it's a time to be serious. So it doesn't conflict with the two, they don't conflict. The end of this narration actually, when they were playing with the food and so on and so forth and they were all laughing, they said we were laughing like this until we heard a loud voice say, Ya Abdullah. This was Umar radiallahu anhu seeking permission to enter upon the Prophet So then here the Prophet when he heard Umar, he told his wives, he told Saud radiallahu anhu and Aisha to quickly to get up and wash your faces. And so Aisha said, I was surprised at the Haiba that the Prophet ﷺ had for Umar. So the Haiba basically is like when someone, you know, it's the kind of person that you, you're in, at awe of them and you don't fool around or play in front of them and they have this commanding presence. So Aisha said, I was amazed at the amount of Haiba the Prophet ﷺ had for Umar. And from that day on, I would always have Umar. That day I would always have this Haiba towards Umar radiallahu anhu from how I saw the Prophet ﷺ had Haiba towards him. But again, this was a look at the house of the Prophet ﷺ and how they dealt and how they joked. Inshallah, when we, when we come back from the break, we're going to continue with the life of Sauda radiallahu anhu.
though. It's only his first time. So? Everybody is doing it. Yeah, man. Hey, everybody's got experience. He didn't have to. Man, he's gonna look so good. Man, I feel good. Yeah. <laughs> hey, is he okay? Hey, what's wrong? Hey, we better pull over. What's going on back there? He's not breathing. Pull over, pull over! Oh my god. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back. So continuing on about Sauda radiallahu anha. We said that she was uh, married to the Prophet sallam where after she, her husband had passed away, so she had no one to look after her. She came into the household of the Prophet sallam much at a time when the household and the daughters of the Prophet sallam needed someone to take care of them. It was a time of much sadness, but she comes in with her good humor, and uh, she was, we said, of those who made the two hijras very generous, very obedient, with a sense of sacrifice. When she joined the household of the Prophet Sallam, like we said, she in, enlivened the, the atmosphere by telling stories of Abyssinia, giving them the news of their sister and the daughter of the Prophet Sallam, Ruqayya, who was there with Uthman, her husband. And when Ruqayya came back to Mecca, they now met again, because they knew each other in Abyssinia, but now they met this time as mother and stepdaughter. After the Prophet Sallam made hijrah to Medina, because he made hijrah, we all know the story, with Abu Bakr, and they went there alone. Now, when he res arrived in Medina, he sent for his household. So he sent for Sauda radiallahu anha, and Umm Kulthum, and Fatima, and, and Umm Ayman, who is the wife of Zayd ibn Haritha, and his son, Usama ibn Zayd. Now, so now we have Umm Ayman, and Zayd, and Usama ibn Zayd. They're also part of the household, other people who are in the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, um, we said we described her that she was tall, and uh, she was a tall woman, and she had a sense of humor. Ibn Sa'd mentions that once she was making night prayers behind the Prophet sallallahu and then uh, the Prophet made the, with the bowing, the the, the ruku, or possibly the sujud. It was very very long, of course, as we know the Prophet's night prayer was extremely long. So the Prophet made the sujood or the ruku, it was for so long. And Sauda radiallahu anha, she came and she started to pray behind him. And then she tells him the next day that, the, that I feared that my nasal vein would burst. And so she said I was praying while I was holding my nose because it was so long. She felt the blood rush and the Prophet laughed at her story. There's also another narration that talks about how uh, she was extremely scared like when the, the Prophet told the Muslims about the Masih Dajjal, that she was so scared of a Dajjal that the Aisha and the other wives would sometimes purposely scare her about uh, the Jala and make it look as if he's going to show up at any moment. It said in one of the, the narrations that said that one time they scared her so much that she went and hid and the Prophet ﷺ entered the room and they, they were all laughing and she was hiding and, and everybody started laughing at the incident. Now uh, also in the history of At-Tabari and in the seerah of Ibn Hisham and in other books you find an interesting story that something that happened after the battle of Badr. So this is after the Prophet was married to Sauda, they had moved to Medina. After the Battle of Badr, the Muslim army comes back to Medina and of course all the prisoners were there. Among the prisoners was Suhail ibn Amr. So remember we said she was married to Sakran ibn Amr. So this is Sakran ibn Amr's brother, Suhail ibn Amr. And he was captured by, with, from the army of the Quraysh, brought in as a captive of the Muslims and he was under the care of Malik ibn Dakhtam. So here uh, on the way to Medina he said that he needed to go relieve himself and so they let him go so he could go to the bathroom and then he escaped. So now the army stopped and they started to look for him everywhere and then the companions found him behind the tree. So when they found him they captured him again but this time they tied his hands to his neck. So they brought him tied because he had tried to escape obviously. So now Sauda saw him in this position when he was being, like the army came into Medina in the streets and she saw him tied like this. So then without, like involuntarily, without uh, thinking, she said it would, uh, that he, you should have died a noble death ex rather than seeing such a shameful day. Because of course back then to be co killed in battle and so on for the Arabs was a noble death or to be killed for your cause or for what you believe. So now she was telling him that it would have been better for you to be killed a noble death than to be seen, than to see such a shameful day when you come in tied like this with your hands to your neck. So then the Prophet ﷺ heard her 
And then he told her, are you stirring up this prisoner against Allah and against his Prophet? And then he tells her, how could it be a noble death if he's killed by the army of Allah and the Amri, the messenger of Allah? That's not a noble death if you're killed by the army of the Prophet ﷺ. So then she was ashamed at that and she apologized to the Prophet ﷺ saying that she spoke without thinking but she said that she was sorry. So the Prophet ﷺ smiled. Then, now look the, the catalyst here, look at this uh, incident and what it caused. Then the Prophet ﷺ told everyone to treat the, the prisoners very well. So this is as a result of what Sauda said. He tells the, everyone to treat the prisoners well. And as a result, the Muslims who started to treat them so well, it is said that sometimes they would feed their prisoners before they even feed themselves. Give their prisoners food and then they would eat for themselves. So as a result of this kind treatment, many of them, many of the prisoners became Muslim, including Suhail bin Amr, including the brother of, of her ex-husband or her widowed, uh, deceased husband. Suhail ibn Amr then became a Muslim and actually later on all of his brothers became Muslim as well. So he had like two or three other brothers, all of them came and entered into Islam. So now we move on to after the death of the Prophet وسلم, and Sauda radiallahu anha is one of the mothers of the believers and of course she's staying in her home the entire time and all of the Khulafa always wanted, and ha wanted to have the honor of taking care of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. So they would send them amounts of money, they would send them money um, either for themselves or to distribute to do whatever they want with it. So Umar anhu during his reign when he was a Khalifa, he sent her a bag full of dirhams. So, so she said, basically she said, what is this bag? They told her it's full of dirhams, full of money. So a bag loaded with money. So she, she said, you know, this is a bag for dates. So she's saying that this is a huge amount. Like, they were, the money was bagged as if it was like dates. You know, dates come in a, a sack or a bag and wheat comes in a sack or a bag. But money doesn't usually come in a bag. Someone gives you a little bit of money and that's it. But she, she said, this is like, you know, a bag for dates. So she tells the girl, bring me, you know, some, some smaller bags and she starts to distribute the entire amount to the needy. So this was just part of her generosity. And radiallahu anha, she dies at the age of 80. And she had narrated a hadith uh, from the Prophet wasallam. She narrated in one hadith how one of their goats had died and they used the skin uh, until it got worn out. So then we, we know from this hadith of Sauda that it's, this is the proof that it's permissible to use the skin of a dead animal. Another famous hadith that we all know from the Musnad of Imam Ahmad about the performing Hajj on behalf of uh, your deceased relative. But I'm running out of time, so I have to wrap it up, inshallah, in the next episode. So make sure you're with us when we discuss the next episode, inshallah, and conclude the life of Sauda. Zakumullah khair for being an excellent audience. Sallallahu wa baraka ala Muhammad wa ala ali sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.